Just briefly, for people who came in late, the slides are at coevolving.com slash common slash publications. Um, and actually, if you bug me and you came in really late and you want the whole thing, I have audio recordings. I always do audio recordings. Oh, that's great. So it take, take, me, take me a while to get it. That, and and I, I'm actually, I actually have my own YouTube channel because uh, oh, wow. I do these lectures quite regularly. And a lot, th this one is new, but you can actually hear the last year's lecture I gave and stuff like that. So a lot of the stuff you'll hear and you kind of go, oh yeah, he said that, but in a different way. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I never give the same lecture twice. Okay, so we've covered um, kind of two-fifths. I was going to skip over it, and Jeremy actually gave me more time to cover in this class than uh, the other class by the time. Do you, does anyone have any like show-stopping questions that we want to cover right now before I plunge on? How many years does it take to actually get a good understanding of systems? Because I, I feel like I'm starting to understand some of it, but I feel like I might read one of the new Yeah. Yeah, so th this is when we do the advertisement for System Thinking Ontario, which is, it's a lifetime pursuit. Um, I, I, I didn't start in systems, so I started in 1998, and the reason I started was I had an assignment at the Advanced Business Institute, uh, which is IBM ed Executive Education Facility. They used to give away education for free. And um, uh, Steve Heckel wrote this book called Adaptive Enterprise, and I, I studied at that point like business for eight years. Like I have an undergrad in commerce, I have an MBA from Kellogg School, two years in the PhD program at UBC. And Steve Heckel was saying all these unreasonable sorts of things, and he finally said, "Go read some Russ Acoff." Um, while he was writing the book, and then when after when I started work writing the book, it actually gave me a really good foundation because I'd say, "Steve, um, this is what you're writing in the book, but Russ says this, and how does that compare?" And so one of the observers to this actually said that they believed that Steve would never have written the book except for the arguments we should get into. Because at one point, um, uh, Steve said, um, I told you to read Russ Acoff, not become Russ Acoff. Um, Russ Acoff, and, and you guys had a reading from uh, John Chi, um, Carol Jadoggi, who was working directly with him. Um, Acoff is really valuable. He is the most published author in uh, system thinking. Um, and he is really great because he is clear. He is super, super clear. After you've got the clarity, then you can figure out why he's wrong. And, and so you end up with this sort of thing. So that's why you see me dipping into Acoff and then out of Acoff and into Acoff and out of Acoff because of that clarity. And so um, people that uh, actually understand Acoff well, great systems thinkers. He, uh, he had um, the program at University of Pennsylvania, uh, and I meet these people, and like, brilliant. Uh, but passing that on and trying to move um, beyond that, uh, when, when I was president of the International Society for the System Sciences, my agenda was that uh, most of the system thinking that you see is actually kind of 1980s era, and that's where it's frozen. But system sciences have moved past that, and it's gone and continued with all the sort of work, and people aren't recognizing that. So the difference between me and a lot of the other people in the system community is I'm actually current with the research and I'm trying to push particular things forward. So yeah, you'll get to it. Just if, let's put it this way. Try to keep the third Wednesday of the month after you graduate from this program. Come back to System Thinking Ontario because we have these discussions and everyone there is still trying to figure stuff out. Like, you know, I still come. Yeah. So between structure and function, which one of those comes first in your perspective? Uh, okay, so function is, well, so they, they all kind of exist. Um, it's, not, it's not a preceding sort of thing. The, the issue with function, so, so if you're doing stuff like system dynamics, so you, you have to be really careful of the language. So the International Society for the System Sciences, when I took it to uh, INCOSI, which is the systems engineering community, they're, they're making jokes because firstly, you say systems, which is, not, which is plural, not singular, and then you say sciences, and engineers don't like that. It's like, how could you be working on multiple sciences? So um, systems dynamic, system dynamics is within a system, and it focuses on structure and process. They focus less on, pro on, uh, on um, function because they don't look at the containing whole. 
The containing whole generally means that you're in what's called hierarchy theory, and that's really what um, Timothy Allen actually does, which he's, he's a leader in hierarchy theory, which says, you know, looking at the uh, water versus hydrogen and oxygen sort of stuff. If you had to do that on two-dimensional gra graph and draw it, then it's like, well, you can draw it, but function actually doesn't happen on a flat surface like that. It's actually multidimensional. So th they all happen. And, and so another thing that, that uh, you end up in a debate, particularly with systems engineers, they go, are systems real? And the answer is systems are not real. Systems are human beings' way of dealing with the complexity in the world. That's the way we represent things. And so systems are never real. Uh, all these constructs about function and structure, they're things that we make up to try to understand the real world and, dis and discuss with each other. The, one of the first things that happens when you get into system thinking is you have to make sure you're both discussing the same system. And then <coughs> when you're discussing the same system and you draw a boundary around it, is the boundary in both time and in space. And then when after you've drawn the system, what is the environment around that? Because we don't think about the environment as bounded, but when you talk about it, the environment can't be everything, right? So uh, in, in the Tavistock work, they have what's called a field. The field is, in effect, the relevant environment when you're talking about it. So you, you have the system and it's in the field, which is the relevant environment. So I didn't answer your question, but <laughs> I'm kind of wondering how to. Yeah, I think because in science, like, structure always equals function, right? So if you change the structure, it will Yes. So, so in mechanical systems, structure equals function. In biological systems, that's not the case. And so um, I was teaching up in OCAD, and so uh, we're talking about parts, holes, and their relations. The parts are actually systems. So in your body, you have your respiratory system and you have your digestive system, and they operate in parallel. But deciding which one is a part of what, it's kind of like, well, the digestive system and the respiratory system are not independent because your digestive system probably takes gases into account. So it's like, ugh. So the parts are actually systems. They're not just mechanistic, you know, carburetor type parts. And, and that's, that's the challenge of getting over it. And, and, and if you start working on systems thinking, it's never clear. Like, it's the sort of thing you just kind of go, oh, you know, like you're, you're, you're on a streetcar, you're going, you're thinking, you're like, oh, that's a system, and okay, I get it now. It, this, this stuff just takes a while. Um, there's no fast way of doing it. OK, let me proceed. Um, I'm going to talk about um, unfreeze, change, and freeze, which gets me into uh, disruptive innovation theories compared to innovation learning theory, which is the stuff that, that that's the book. Um, I'm going to talk about a history of socio-psychological, uh, technical, and ecological systems that comes from Tavistock, which leads to causal texture theory, pacing layers of change, and then uh, product process change matrix, which people find actually quite practical. OK. How, have you, how many of you have done organizational change and have heard of, of unfreeze, change, freeze? Okay, so have some of maybe an OD perspective. Um, so if you're doing organizational change, this is kind of the foundational idea. And it comes from Kurt, remember it's, it's, it's red, new but it's actually pronounced Levine. Uh, unfreeze, change, and refreeze. And the idea is how you change a system is that you go through this period and you come and you unfreeze the system. And it's like going to army boot camp. Well, how do you create a new army? Well, first thing, you take all these people and you break them down to boot camp so they're all equal, which is the unfreezing part. And then you give them new behavior, which is changing it, and then you freeze it and you reinforce it. So you now have an army that operates the same way. That's the way the army works. But if you actually look at the history of this, and this is actually something new, so I was just thinking of this lecture, it's like, well, this change has three steps, as they call it. Um, unfreeze, change, and refreeze was not something that actually uh, Lewin, Levine, actually wrote himself. He actually wrote the unfreeze part. And then it turns out that over the 50s, 1950s, 1960s, they came up with the change and freeze parts. But when you're looking at this sort of, of idea, this is based off more ideas of structure than process, although it's kind of structure process. When, and if, if you're thinking about um, looking at it from the perspective of the day, you could talk about it like um, ecologists do when you're trying to do regime shifts. So multiple stable states. You're trying to move from one stable state to another stable state. And the way you would do that is you have a stable state, you have this transition, and then you try to push them into a new stable state. Um, can you do that? Will it stick? Uh, have people read Innovator's Dilemma, Clayton Christensen? Okay. 
So Innovator's Dilemma, uh, the original research, it's actually 1997, it's actually quite old now. Uh, when uh, Christensen was doing his PhD, he did research into three and a half inch disk drives and five and a quarter inch disk drives. Essentially, uh, manufacturers had this issue, which was uh, as PC technology was coming out, they were building five and a quarter inch drives, hard drives. And uh, the more you build them, the better they get, the price goes down, the quality goes up, the capacity goes up. But there came this thing called a laptop, and you could move either use old technology that was a five and a quarter inch drive, or you can move to three and a half inch drives, smaller drives that fit in laptops. And so they end up with what they call the innovator's dilemma. You can either satisfy the old marketplace, the old people that were buying all the five and a quarter inch drives, and they're reliable, you make them happier. And as a matter of fact, if you go survey those customers, it's kind of like, I want exactly what I've got, except I want it faster, and I want more capacity. The other way of looking at it would be to make the shift into a new unproven market. Three and a half inch drives, there are no standards, they break down more, uh, so they're unreliable, and they have less capacity, so why would you do that? And so you end up with the innovator's dilemma, um, and it's actually a reworking of uh, Schumpeter's creative destruction idea, where you start off with uh, what's called sustained technologies, you have this curve, you have product performance, but then the question is, should you actually jump to a different curve? Um, so for, for, the, for the benefit, and Adam and I kind of know each other, um, working through IBM, people at IBM are going through this process right now. Um, and you have to have been through one before, because when I joined IBM, I was there before Lou Gerstner took over, and so I was there when the company actually could have gone bankrupt. And so when you ha have to go through a change like this, is this the sort of change you want to look at, where you're making a shift, and you're doing the unfreeze, change, and refreeze? Or is there something different? Uh, 2006, you weren't with IBM in 2006, were you? 2006, I wasn't with IBM. Okay, so this is the mantra that we learned, and it's actually pretty good. Um, so, is, what's, what's going on with innovation? And the nature of innovation has changed. And they said, innovation is now open, collaborative, multidisciplinary, and global. Which is really great to say, and you know, and so it's kind of as IBM, or I learned this mantra, and say, you know, innovation has changed, way of looking at innovation, but it doesn't really make sense to me. So I was like, I wrote a blog post a long time ago. If that doesn't make sense, well, what was it before if it was not open, collaborative, multidisciplinary, global? So we had the idea of industrial age where uh, you had the idea of private, where you used to have private R&D. So we had IBM Research, you have Bell Labs, you had North, Northern Telecom, well, I think Northern Tele. Uh, but essentially the idea that came out of there was that you did all your research, you did development, you had a pipeline, and everything was done internally. We have this change towards open standards, interfaces, and choosing expedient platforms for, uh, for advancing design. And so this is on the basis of the book, uh, Open Innovation Learning. And I take as an example now, which if this is a research book, has to be backward looking. If you look at IBM's cloud technologies today, where were all those technologies developed? So number one, IBM Bluemix, or IBM Cloud it's called now, was actually developed by Pivotal. It's an open source project. And it's interesting going over to Pivotal and going over there because Pivotal guys are complaining, you know, Pivotal's doing all the legwork on this stuff and IBM is free riding on us and it's like, we wish IBM would just contribute more people to work on the Pivotal project. Except they forget that IBM invested the first billion dollars in Linux in 1999. And, and then, I think it was two years ago, they committed the second billion dollars. And so IBM is contributing to an open source community it's like, well, you know, could they actually do the, build the operating systems internally? Well, they don't do that anymore. It's a shift in strategy. So the idea that you would have private research versus open research is, is new. The idea that the relationships are transactional. Traditionally, we think of transactional as production chains, value chains, that sort of way. And you have know, interorganizational contracts. So if you look at economics, you took a theory of the firm. The, assumption, the question is, why do firms exist? Why do you everything in the marketplace? And it's because of these transaction cost economics, and everything works that way. But the idea today is you have collaborative where your alliance is co-producing and doing accelerated learning. That's why GitHub is important. Everyone here has been on GitHub or understand GitHub? Okay, so everyone knows Linus Torvalds. Number one invention from Linus Torvalds was? Linus Torvalds invented, oh, well, this is why, this is why I do, I come here to do history of science stuff for you. <laughs> Linus Torvalds was a grad student at University of Helsinki and um, invented Linux. 
Okay? What was, so the, the, the tough question with no one guess, what was Linus Torvald's number two invention? Linus Torvald's number two invention was Git. And what is Git? Git is a check-in, check-out system for code. Because when you are working on a project, there's two ways of working on it. The old way of working on code was, I'm working on code, and no one else can work on it while I'm working on it. I'm building a computer system, you guys can't touch it. Now, you're doing everything serially now. That's not the way to do things. So what Linus Torvald did, did was invent a parallel technology, and in effect, the way that GitHub works is that you have sections. And so Jeremy works on chapter one, and I'm working on chapter nine, and we each write that independently, and then what happens is at a certain point in time, we come back and say, okay, did something I write impact you? And we go back and we mesh those things up. But that's what you do in this sort of environment where you're dealing collaboratively and you're dealing in an efficient way. You can parallelize stuff because people don't work on everything in a complicated structure. Now, when you make the complexity, when you want to make it a complex system, you have to put it back together again. But you're designing it so that you can actually go from complex to complicated, back to complex, complicated, and going back and forth like that. Well, the method before used to be analytical problem solving, and you understand what that means now. The new way is multidisciplinary conversations, where people are constantly in dialogue, and I understand next week Peter will be talking about that sort of stuff. The economics used to be about colonial trade, in effect having a headquarters in one country, now it's global talent. People live all around the world and work with information. So that's how innovation has changed. So if we're actually looking at innovation, um, can we look, approach it from a different way? So I'm going to jump to uh, what's in my book, which is actually chapter 9, uh, and talk about the work of Tim Ingold. Um, and Tim Ingold has his 27 article, 2017 article, which has really changed the philosophy of the way I look at systems. Um, if you want a reference on this, this has changed me from being a Akoff guy to being a Bateson guy. But the idea is that the way that I've already described a system to you is pretty traditional, where people draw systems with system and then the environment around. So you draw a circle with a system and around the outside you have the environment. There's a different way of looking at it, which is looking time first. So the different way of drawing systems would be, I am on a line. And my line kind of squiggles over time. You know, I wander, I work on this project, I work on that project. But you can imagine I'm on a line, I have this life line. And then we come in and we have other people's lines. So Jeremy is on a line and Adam is on a line. We're all working away. Every once in a while we come together and we form a knot. And then we go away again and we're off. But what happens is that we make that connection and the knots come at different points in time. And this is a different way of looking at systems. And, and what um, Tim Ingold writes about is human lifelines, in, he calls it correspondence. I'm trying to be clearer and say co-responding because it's not like me and a machine, it is me interacting with someone else. So I am, I am responding to them and they're responding to me, right? So now we're talking about a, a system, it's, this is called an ecological approach to anthropology, to epistemology, because it's interactive. It's more than interactive, it's co-responding. But it's based off a theory of one habit. So habit versus volition. And he talks about walking as an example. So when you are walking, your legs are doing the walking. So is it your legs moving you or are you moving your legs? It's actually both simultaneously, right? So how do you design a system where you're trying to now model your legs moving in a world? Are you moving your legs? Are you moving, or are you moving your legs or are legs moving you? It's both. You kind of got this co-responding thing happening. The second is agency <coughs> rather than agency, and we have this idea of co-responding, and the co-responding is more than interaction. So in design, of course, a lot of stuff interaction design, which was fine when you were in the age where you didn't have artificial intelligence on the other side. If you have artificial intelligence on the other side, you're not co-responding. And thirdly, intentionality rather than intentionality. And we have these ideas uh, as an example of, um, let me check the next slide. No, I'm not gonna go there. Okay, so um, we have the idea of, uh, of learning um, and how people learn. Um, and, and so Ingold focuses on, there's two, there's two ideas about learning, you want to knowledge management. 
most of the learning stuff has actually been focused on whole philosophy, which is about transmitting information. And so I have knowledge in my head, I'm trying to transmit it into your head, um, and that's the way to think about it. But another way of looking at it is, I'm, what I'm trying to do is focus attentionality. And so, of all the system stuff that I've told you, you know, I actually doubt that I'm actually telling you much more than Jeremy's already told you. But what I'm doing is I'm directing your attention. So I'm giving you all the references. You can go read the references, but you may not get the same ideas just like interacting in class, right? So there's an intentionality there. Uh, the, uh, there's a distinction made between a maze and a labyrinth. A maze has multiple ways in and multiple ways out. Essentially, it's problem solving. If you go to a labyrinth, and you go back to the Greek stories of labyrinth, there's a labyrinth is a multi, uh, 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 sorry, a maze is a multi-cursal puzzle. A labyrinth is a unicursal puzzle. A labyrinth has one way in and one way out. If you go over to um, Trinity Square, they actually have a labyrinth there on the ground. You can take your kids and run around it. Um, but there's one way in and there's one way out. So why would you be interested in a labyrinth? So what's the story of the labyrinth? The idea is that you would go into a labyrinth and you get lost in the labyrinth. You kind of... Um, it wouldn't, it's not that you couldn't find your way out because it's pretty clear the way in and the way out is pretty clear but you get so involved in it that you forget to even leave the yeah, labyrinth and people are trapped in the labyrinth because they're not paying attention so why go back to an art gallery you've been there before you've been to the art gallery you go back again it's because when you go you're paying attention to different things and you come back to a painting and you say oh I know this painting and you go wow I never noticed that before you know, what was it that changed? Was it you or the painting? It's probably you that changed. Something happened to you, and you're looking at the painting, and you're going, oh, I'm not seeing it in the same way I saw it like two years ago. It looks different. And that's due with intentionality. So these are the sort of things I'm trying to bake into um, the way that I'm moving on system thinking. I'm going to take you back to uh, some more stuff. This goes back to World War II, uh, and, but this, this is a tradition on most, what most of the management theory in um, systems was developed on. The Tavistock Institute in the UK came up with three, three perspectives on systems, and uh, they all happened at the same time, social psychological, social technical, and social ecological. There's actually a, uh, a three-volume publication called the Tavistock Anthology, and it has all the papers, and they've separated into those three, but they say, don't get confused. It's not because they were done sequentially, it's just what they were working on at a period of time. Social psychology, so socio psychological perspective had to do mostly with the work of getting soldiers coming back from war. So soldiers came back in the Second World War, and the problem essentially was you've got these veterans now, and they're, uh, we, now we call it PTSD, right? So they're traumatized, and society thinks that they should readapt. And so the conventional way would be we need to change the way these veterans are coming back into society. An alternative way of looking at it would be, no, we need to change society for the veterans coming back. How is it we change the institutions so that the psychology of the people is better supported? So it reverses the way that psychology was being done at the time, which says it's all about the person, all about the veteran, you know, and, and we look into the veteran's head, we try to do head shrinking stuff, it's like, no, 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 change the environment, don't change the system. The second one, socio-technical systems, came out during the period of coal mining. And the original studies that were done, and uh, they're pretty clear, it's actually good to read the original articles, the, the Tristan Bamford um, article in Management Science, 1967 or something like that. It's really old, but the old journal articles used to be readable. And they talk about uh, the way that mining had changed, because it used to be that mining, you go in with a pickaxe and your family, and you take down walls, and that's how you do it. And they came up with these new machines called long wall machines. And what would happen would be that you would have this machine, everyone would have a crank, you turn the crank and you move the machine down, it takes down some of the wall, and then you shovel things out. Um, and this is when mechanization started coming in. But when they did that, people started dying. Because before they had the family structures, now they had that a, a human being is part of the machine. And it serves the machine. And so how do you reorganize work? And so the socio-technical systems uh, movement came up with the idea of things like job rotation. Um, and the most interesting trivia to me is in 1983, Eric Trist was at York University 
Um, and he published the last paper for the Ontario Ministry of Labor. He published the last paper on quality of work life. And it's actually available at the University of Toronto Library. I'm going to look at it. Because that's kind of where that, that stuff kind of ended up. Um, the idea of quality of work life, people who have work life balance, all that stuff came out of this research. Um, the idea was uh, about design principles, and so they had one of joint optimization, which is like human beings and machines together. And the second is redundancy of function versus redundancy of parts. This speaks to your question about one to one and one to many. Because if you are dealing with an engineer, they do one to one, but human beings have multiple functions and they can adapt. So a machine typically is designed for one function or a limited number of functions, but human beings will adapt to that. And so a redundancy of functions does not mean a redundancy of parts. You can have one person doing multiple things, and as a matter of fact, that's what people do best. If people do one thing only, they get bored. The third perspective, uh, social ecological perspective, had to do with the rapid change that started happening. And this is about. Uh, uh, in the 90s, when think, tr uh, change in the world started happening really fast. And it turns out that the, that, uh, the way they were dealing with that was uh, a lot of organizational change issues. And that comes to yeah, the, the open systems approach. So you have a more traditional way of looking at systems again. You have the system. Uh, now, what you can do is you can look at the planning process, which is the system impacts the environment. This is the L1-2 and the organization learns from that. And so this is a traditional system that we've looked at. However, there are other things going on. One is that inside the system, you've got these internal part-part relations going on. So there's changes happening internally. Plus, at the same time, you've got down here, part-part uh, part stuff. So stuff's happening in the environment that has nothing to do with the organization. And all these things are changing simultaneously. And so this was based off some work um, on direct correlation by Sommerhoff. And I'll give you the short answer. This is a very difficult paper, a seminal system paper, uh, but I spent like three days working on it. I'll, I'll give you the, the, the answer. There's two ways of playing soccer, football. One is you move to the ball. The other is the ball comes to you. Profound, but. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were dealing with a system, do you go to the ball or does the ball come to you? Because if you are dealing with ecology, it's like running doesn't help, right? You could just wait for the ball to come to you, just patient enough. Now, if it's not coming fast enough, you can move towards it. But the, the idea is that you could or you might, you might or you might not take action. The causal texture of, so, of, of, of social environments is one of the oldest papers and most cited in management uh, literature in organizational behavior. And there are four types of fields they talk about. So field is the environment, system and its environment. And the story they tell is the first type, so uh, random placid, you have a surface. You have animals on the surface. You have food on the surface. So what's the rule? You eat, there's food everywhere, you don't care. That is a random placid environment. The food is randomly distributed, everything is great, no problem. Second environment, clustered placid. Clustered placid is there's animals, there's an animal on the surface, and the food is no longer everywhere, it's in little clumps. So what's the rule now? What's the behavior that happens? You move to the food. When you finish that food, it's gone, you move to the other one. Third one, disturbed reactive. This is um, the previous one, now you have competition. So there are multiple animals on the surface, there are multiple clumps of food on the surface. What's the rule? Move for food. If there's someone else already there, move somewhere else. There's lots of food around, it's in clumps, but originally you're gonna bump into someone else. The fourth type of environment is turbulent. You have the surface, you're in an earthquake. The food is getting pushed all over the place, you're getting thrown all over the place, what do you do? The answer is you actually need to coordinate at this point. You have, you have to work with the other people because it's not just about the food, if you're going to smash into each other and kill each other, because the, uh, the ground is so turbulent. So when you are looking at the environment, you're in one of these types of environments, and when you're designing a system, are you designing for that type of field? So if we look at very slow changing, so we were talking earlier about the uh, Ontario health system, 
and e-health and government, stuff like that, that's a very slow system. You don't really want to be dealing with that in a turbulent environment. Like, you really need to change that system and say, look, uh, we could deal with this in one of the other ways, but this is the type of environment we're in. Not everything in the world is turbulent. We make it that way. A lot of it is self-induced. Okay, this is the point at which I stopped last time. I'm going to jump on this. Um, okay, I'll give you the, the briefest description of my book, uh, of the findings from my book. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> there will be a video on my website. I recorded the book launch, so you can always look at that. Uh, okay, here's homework for you. On YouTube, there is a series called How Buildings Learn. Watch this series. Um, Stuart Brand, who, who uh, the co-founder of the Long Now Network, had, uh, Long Now Foundation, had done this, and this is the idea of pacing layers, um, and, the, and the metaphor comes from this, which is you can look at a building that the, originally Stuart Brand wanted to study organizational learning, but organizational learning is not something he could really study, so he studied how buildings learn, and this is a systems perspective because most of us consider people are in the building and people are the system, and uh, we learn. But if you look at the other way around with the system perspective, you can look at the change in buildings and how they learn. So you describe this in multiple layers. You start off with the site, which is the uh, foundation. And from here, uh, you build the load-bearing walls or the structure. And after the load-bearing structure, you put in the skin, which protects the outside of the building. After that, you put in the, the services. You put in the electricity, you put in the plumbing, all that sort of stuff inside the walls. You put in the space plan, which is the non-load-bearing walls. Um, and after that, you put in the stuff, which is all the furniture. And so this is a, a pacing layers view of systems and how they work. The reason that I like this is because it, it gets you to thinking about structure and process in two different ways. Um, it, it, it actually puts the process and makes it material and changing over time. Now let's talk about how you make changes. So if you are going to uh, have, uh, if you leave a house, um, you, you can have a choice. Uh, wait, this way the storing clothes. You can store clothes in a closet or you can store it in an armoire. An armoire is part of the stuff, which is furniture. It moves around rapidly. You can move it around. A closet is fixed into the wall. When you leave the house, you cannot take the closet with you. You can take an armoire with you. When you are designing things, you need to figure out whether you want to design it in a, fat, a quickly changing layer or a slowly changing layer. When you, if, you, if you actually follow through and go to How Buildings Learn, he talks about the Pompidou Center in, um, in Paris where they did watch through something um, outrageous. And what they did was they put the services outside the skin, which is not a good idea because all the air conditioned ducting, ducting is outside and it's corroding because of acid rain. So th there's a logic behind doing these things. Uh, a helpful way of looking up about change, um, this is a, uh, 1993, uh, people kind of know this as a mass customization framework or the dynamic stability framework, is that there are ideas of product change and process change. Um, and if you have a stable product, uh, so, so the way we normally go through this model is we start off with invention mode. The first time you build something, you have a product that's dynamic, everything you invent is different, and the process by which you do it is dynamic. After you do an invention, you come down into mass production mode. When, what they do in mass production is you try to stabilize the product so you create the same thing over and over again, and you try to stabilize the processes so you can do it with quality. After that, you move into continuous improvement mode, so and here we're kind of in the Model T, every, color, every car is almost black. You can make incremental improvements to that, which is we have a foundation or a platform and you build on top of that in variation. But there's this idea that you might be able to shift someday up into the mass customization framework, which is to have a dynamic process, a dynamic product, and a stable process. The trick behind this is that people who are working in mass customization cannot move to mass customization. You can't do that. You have to go through this helix which is to start in mass production, go to continuous improvement, do a process transformation, and then you can get to mass customization. So I pretty well run out of time, I think. I'm going to run out of time shortly. So I'm going to have to figure out what I'm going to jump to here. Um, let's see. 
I think I need to do just one thing on services. Um, okay. So I'm going to jump to the end. And out of all these things, I'm going to do uh, B and E. So I'll talk about the theory of the offering and talking about adaptive change. So there's been a lot of work on service systems. I can come and do a different lecture for that. Um, the one that I recommend is that you actually look at the work of Rafael Ramirez um, and Richard Norman, who's the originator of this, and his idea of theory of the offering. And the, the problem essentially when you get into the service economy is that um, there's two ways of approaching service economy. One, if you've actually done work in service science, is um, uh, Steve Bargo's work, which is on service dominant logic. And in service dominant logic, uh, I talked to Steve about this and asked me to do this research. And he said, of course he knows this research. I asked him, well, why do you have service dominant logic? He says, there's two ways of approaching you thinking. One is you use all the same words and, um, and overload them. And the other one is you create a new vocabulary. So what Richard Norman did, systems thinker, he created a new vocabulary for looking at systems. What Steve, Hack what Steve um, Vargo does with term term down logic is he says, I'm doing research on services, and then he redefines what services means. So this one's a little bit clearer. Essentially, the idea is that we have offerings, and offerings have three dimensions. There is a physical component, so if you look at automobile, that's a physical car. Service content, which is um, the um, uh, financing, um, the, uh, all sort of things you get along with the car, it could be like OnStar, uh, those sorts of things. And then people content, which could be the maintenance afterwards, the relationship you have after the fact. And the way you should approach this is, um, we normally started off with the idea of offering as output, you're doing systems, so you have input outputs, uh, input process output. The offering as output gives industrial logic and a customer value to transactions. And so essentially the idea here is, when you, someone sells a car, when you buy the car, you own the car. That's it, the transaction is done. The value is in the actual physical, physical asset. There's been a movement towards um, a service logic, which is to have a relationship. So the automobile manufacturers don't actually make money on the vehicle. They make money on the financing and they make money on the, um, uh, on the uh, maintenance after the car. But that's through having a customer value through a relationship. They have to have a relationship with you. If, you, if you're doing your own maintenance, doing your own oil changes, that's less of a relationship. If you have the idea of an offering as an input, you have a self-service logic. So someone could actually be an auto fuel manufacturer and give you all the parts for a car and you assemble it. So that means that you're actually doing, you're, you're not, you don't care about the assembled car. For those of you who want a custom bicycle, it's more practical, or a mass customized bike. What happens is that they give you all the components and you change them yourself, you build them yourself. Then you have a partnership logic, which is a relationship logic that is, um, in the long term, you, you, you deal with, a, a, it could be like a joint venture, and so um, it, it could be a couple of research organizations coming together. They don't know what the outcome's going to be. They come with a physical product, a service product, and a people content all together, and that's input, not the output. Now you can't mix this up because there's a difference between having a self-service logic where you come in and you do something regularly and it's through a transaction. So it's like going to an ATM machine. Going to an ATM machine is not like actually going in a partnership with someone and building something together that's going to make money in the longer term. The difference in the thinking towards this is that traditionally we think about supply chain, we think about value added. And this is the idea that you have a product to add things on top. Whereas if you come with this, uh, and IKEA is usually the example they talk about, when you are building stuff from IKEA, it is a co-production. Uh, you could pay someone to assemble the IKEA furniture for you, but value proposition is actually then putting things together with you, so you, you are actually contributing to the co-production. Uh, okay, jump down to the end. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so in terms of all the service delivery models and stuff, how do you think this is going to affect business education, how we see it now, right? Like, are we going to end up with a chief patterning officer? Okay, hold on. Now I have to go back to one of the slides that actually addresses that. <laughs> Sorry, but... It, no, it's good. It's good. It's, I just, I see this and I see, like... Okay. 
business is a massive driver of our economy yep. and our culture. What's this going to do to the MBAers? Okay, so Jim Sporer, who was at that point a director of Almond and Services Research, was asked the question by the National Science Foundation, how should we change education? So it's for a service economy. And this was his answer was that uh, if you look at primary school education, this is the way we should be educating, not by uh, science and math and stuff like that, but doing it this way. So first we work on systems that move, store, harvest, and process. So transportation systems. When they are in kindergarten, your kids have to get on a bus or walk or whatever. They understand transportation systems. Make them understand that, really. Uh, secondly, water and waste management. You need to understand that water just doesn't happen out of the tap. You know, how does it go uh, in, in with the, the water cycle and the clouds and you know, rivers and all sort of stuff. Uh, food and global supply chain. You need to understand that food doesn't happen at the supermarket. You go to farms. Energy and energy grid. Electricity doesn't just come out of the wall. You can take it to a plant. Um, how does it, so by grade four, they can ask the question, how does your mobile phone actually work? Because that one has mobile phone. You can see the talk here and it ends up over there somewhere. Um, the second category is systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Building and construction is actually a big service industry, it's not a product industry. Banking and finance is obvious, retail, hospitality, healthcare, and education are services. But grade eight is when you focus on the healthcare system. How are you actually supposed to know how a healthcare system works? And I like it that by grade nine, you're talking about education, but they've been in school since kindergarten. So now it's like, why are you there? Systems that govern, grade 10, the government cities, then you get to region state, which is provinces, and then federal. And so the idea is to work from the concrete to the more abstract. And so our education system traditionally has not been oriented towards this way of thinking about service systems. Um, the, there's a differentiation between a production perspective and a service perspective. And this is fundamental to a lot of the work I'm doing on pattern language and the research I'm doing now is we talk about buildings, and um, Christopher Alexander's work on buildings is about getting the building as a product. If we took it instead and we started talking to them in a different way, um, a service perspective, uh, we would change the way they look at it. And the way we do that is by talking about affordances. Um, Um, so I told you about the, um, okay, first I need to do this, sorry. I may have to run over a little bit. I hate to do this to a class, but you guys are asking the question, so let me do this out of order. Um, the systems movement, as a system thing I've been working on has been towards what's called ecological perspective. And so when I'm saying I'm trying to understand ecology in a different way, the history of this was uh, back in the 1950s, 1960s, um, and you go back to behavioral psychology. So behavioral psychology, you have B.F. Skinner, um, he rings the bell, the dog salivates. The way we used to understand people was trying to get inside their heads. J.J. Gibson uh, was uh, kind of the father of ecological psychology, and what he looked at was how is it that we should understand a pilot trying to land a plane on an aircraft carrier? You've got the ship moving, and so the landing moving, and you've got the pilot with this plane, and they're both going together, and how is it you actually get that interaction? What is the system here? Trying to get inside the pilot's head doesn't understand, doesn't help you. What you're trying to do now is understand the interaction between the pilot, the aircraft, and the carrier. And so all this stuff, that's the system you're interested in. You're interested in. And so the question is asked not what's inside your head, but what your head is inside. That's, that's a systems perspective. That is the uh, ecological systems perspective. Talking about the containing whole and getting that idea about what your, system, your head's inside. And that's the hardest part. Now the way that designers actually do this, and they've done it, Don Norman unfortunately did us a really dis bad disservice on this, um, is J.J. Gibson created the idea of an affordance. An affordance is whatever the environment contributes to the kind of interaction that occurs. And traditionally, the way we talk about affordances is a uh, doorknob is an affordance. A doorknob affords you the ability to open a door. If you have a door, you know, you can pull on the door. Um, and the affordance is actually not the doorknob itself. The affordance is the person perceiving that the doorknob exists and they can pull on it. 
Don Norman, when he was doing work at Apple, uh, started talking about real affordances. Well, now, he actually had to rewrite this, the psychology of everything, the design of everything. And so he was talking about the Mac, the Mac trash can as an example. The Mac trash can is an affordance because it allows you to delete stuff. However, when you get to the real J.J. Gibson definition, if a person does not recognize the trash can is to get rid of stuff, it is not an affordance. So if you want to shut off, you know, if you want to eject a disk out of a Mac and the way to do it is to put it in a trash can, that's not an affordance because people usually can't figure that one out, right? In doing service design, when we do affordances, we should be thinking about affordances for uh, low ability and high ability people. So currently, I'm a low ability person. I'm getting my uh, Achilles tendon fixed up. Um, so there's two ways of designing this building for me to come in. One is a complex way, and one's a complicated way. The complicated way for me to get in this building, two entrances. One entrance for the handicap, and one entrance for everyone else that's able-bodied. A complex system would be one entrance, everyone comes in the same way. Now, there's actually no problem having a complicated approach, but we tend to like the complex approaches, so stop and think about it. But in either case, there are affordances, and if you think about them as affordance, what you would have is an entrance that affords me the ability to get into the building. Um, and that's where the research is going now. Um, okay. I had a question about generativity, and so I'm going to close on that. And I'm going to make the differentiation with, with the way you think about systems. There's two ways to think about systems. There's a difference between somatic and uh, uh, between systematic and, and systemic. Uh, the, the better way of describing this, and uh, uh, Bates has described it this way, somatic systems are cellular chains. So if you think about um, going from here to the Rocky Mountains, going to Denver, Rocky Mountain High, altitude, there are somatic chains that happen. When the human body goes to high altitude, the body will adapt eventually, right? Don't drink for the first couple of days, you fall asleep, sort of stuff. Um, but there's also someone who is born at high altitude, and they have a genetic advantage because they are born there. Over generations of time, it'll be built into them. So that's the difference between genetic change and somatic change. Generally, we have a distinction between um, autopoietic and allopoietic. Uh, a, a factory line is a non-living thing and is effect producing. The inputs are not the same as the outputs. And so from biology, this is called allopoiesis, which is creating something different. A generative system is part of living systems uh, and um, it's autopoietic, autopoietic, which means it can reproduce itself. So human beings are autopoietic because we reproduce human beings. Right. Um, but this gets us into the distinction between a reactive system and also a co-responsive system. So um, when you have these sort of things in trying to design a system, you can design them one way or the other. And it's not that one is right or one is wrong. In particular, if you're looking at the allopoietic systems versus the autopoietic systems, it's actually more efficient to create allopoietic systems. Cloning, this sort of stuff, that kind of technology, it actually takes less energy to do cloning than it does to actually do a fully autopoietic human being. So when you're making these sorts of choices, then, um, then, you, then you end up with making decisions about architecting the type of system you're going to work on. Um, with that, I think my time is up. Um, so I'm happy to take questions or hang around or whatever we should do. We have some time for questions. I, I, I have lots of questions. But <laughs> You guys first. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in your direction shifting from ACOF to Bateson. Uh -huh. uh, what's the difference there? I mean, I've heard a lot of uh, Gregory Bateson and his ecological work and um, some of the stuff that he's done as well with um, anthropology. Um, so how does that all work? Um, ACOF, so, so philosophically, OK, hold on. <laughs> um, Let's see if I can find this. Ah. Okay. There's a difference in philosophy that happens, um, and the difference is teleology versus teleonomy. 
So teleology um, is the study of ends. It's philosophy of ends. And so Aristotle has four types of causes. So I talk about, about goals, objectives, and ideals. And uh, what happens is that you end up with trying to figure out how something causes something else. So you're starting from here, and you're kind of moving into the future. Um, tele teleonomy is a study that happens in biology. And it is about programming. So as opposed to having a goal for something, would you actually design a program that might actually influence something in the future? So um, let's talk about, it, about uh, my children, uh, my four sons. Uh, so there's one way of doing this would be, OK, I'm going to raise my children with all these goals. You know, so they, they, they should actually have a goal in life and have purpose. The other philosophy would be, well, I'm actually going to put, I'm going to try to program them a little bit. I'm going to, you know, try them in different sports and different activities. And if they don't like it, that's fine. But it's like all four of my sons can actually play piano, but none of them are really serious about it. Every once in a while, it's like, oh yeah, you go back and oh, I forgot you guys took piano lessons. Doesn't mean they're going to be concert pianists, but that's part of their program because we provided that. I didn't say I want you to be a concert pianist. I didn't even say I want you to learn to piano, play piano. I wanted them to learn music, and so we actually have guitars around. They, they learn how to play guitar by themselves, and we hang around the house, and they play now, and put it down. But a lot of, the, a lot of ACOF stuff, ACOF dissertation became published as on purposeful systems. And so he is all about purpose. Can you get away of, about not talking about purpose? And in most projects you're working on, that's really tough. You usually have a sponsor and they go, why am I sponsoring you? What am I going to get out of this? And so that generally has to do with purpose or ends. And the work that we're working on is much more about process. I'm going to take this process. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, this is the work. So uh, uh, the person that introduced Adam and me is actually uh, Raphael Arar, who's at IBM Research in San Jose. And this is the stuff we're actually focused on. Can you do research on Susu Nosala, who's in, um, in, in uh, Shanghai, we're actually trying to figure out how you do artificial intelligence um, and design together from a process perspective, getting it published. Because if you look at the publication um, way that people, the publishing process now, what happens, you research and you have an output and you publish that. But what happens if you go instead into process orientation, which is we have a journal that actually tracks your progress along the way, and whatever, whatever happens, whatever happens. It's a different way, but you go, well, how do you do peer review? We do peer review on the process. You don't do peer review on the end point. So um, Susu and Raphael are really hot on that, and I'm kind of taking along on that ride. Does that help? Yeah, so Bateson is way over here, and Acoff is over here. Yeah. And in between, you've got all these guys doing e ecology work with resilience and stuff like that, they're biologists. And they're trying to figure out how to satisfy these people. Because you get into environmental management and regime shifts and stuff like that. So watersheds, it's like, how do we change this watershed? And it's kind of like, well, do you want to run to the vault or do you want the vault to come to you? Yeah, that's actually just, um, uh, just uh, when you said that, that's kind of just kind of stuff for me. So what's your take on that? Do you move the vault or does the vault come to you? So this gets to the, uh, abs uh, to the absolve the problem. Um, if you're going to dissolve a problem, when you're actually dissolving the problem and redesigning the system, you want to design self-reinforcing, self-organizing systems. Um, and people generally don't like that. Uh, so the, the person that's influenced me most in the systems community, David Hawk, uh, who was Russ Acoff's first PhD student, uh, and he wrote his PhD at the Wharton School of Finance on anarchy. Anarchy is not chaos. Anarchy is a lack of hierarchy. So everyone is flat. It is the ultimate complicated organization. So if you're going to design a complicated organization with autonomy of the people, how is it you do that? Phelps flat, flat. Yeah. Uh, I just had a quick, uh, I have a couple of questions that I think are really, like a lot of the, people that we get in the SFI course are really interested in change and change making. And so we tend to be focused on how to make change, but we don't necessarily think about the change that's coming, right? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because um, I went to school with uh, a brilliant uh, woman in 
my class who actually went on to, and, and even at that time in systems thinking, her, she had a very strong systems approach. And so her approach was so to uh, afford, affordance, for instance. At the time, she was working on the wheelchair and disability problem. And she was obsessed with the idea that we were going about it all the wrong way, that we, in fact, shouldn't be retrofitting our buildings at half a million dollars a piece, and we shouldn't be doing all this. We should be actually tackling the problem, which is the people. So she went on to design. She's now one of the leading experts in artificial limbs, but also skin suits. Hmm. So she did, I forget what they're called now, but they're, they're suits that if you're in a wheelchair, you can put them on, and you can actually walk. They actually are completely self-supporting, so that you you don't actually need a wheelchair. So the importance is you can now behave like a normal human mm -hmm. being. She's been working on this for 20 years now, mm -hmm. but they're finally getting to the point where they actually exist now. Where if you're in a wheelchair, you can choose. No, I don't want to spend my whole life rolling around. I want to actually be putting on a suit at some point, and I can actually walk society like a mm -hmm. normal person, right? Mm -hmm. So those are interesting ways of looking at it from the system's point of view. Mm -hmm. and my question really is around one of my big projects right now is autonomous vehicles. Ah. And so, and my question, I know this is a long one, but my question is around, at some point systems, they, they become, they know are no longer socio-technical. They actually are almost living. Mm -hmm. And that they, they learn your behaviors, they respond to your habits, they they do they do things that you would do even before you would do them, in fact, right? So and and autonomous vehicles are kind of like that, where they, they have their own program, but they're also programmed to learn. Yeah. And so at, at some point they actually do what you do better than you do. Right, in the, in the sense that, well, normally you would do this, so now I'm going to do it, only I can do it in a fraction of a second, millisecond, whereas you would actually have to think about it for two seconds, right? So we're going into a whole bunch of systems like that, and mm -hmm. there's behavioral problems and attitudes towards it in society, like, yep. am I going to be comfortable with somebody making a better decision like me than me, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, so so the, I have two ideas that come with that. Um, yeah. Have you covered panarchy? Uh, well, you talked about some of yeah. the principles. We've talked about panarchy okay. in terms of the... Okay. So, so the way that um, ecologists look at panarchy is that they tend to look at um, where resilience is strong. Because I'm an organizational change person, I want to look for low resilient systems. If a system is strong, it's resilient, you can't change it. Because whatever you do to it, it's, it kind of stays there. Um, the way that ecologists draw this out is they have what are called um, ball and cup diagrams. And so you have a cup and you've got a ball, it's at the bottom here, and then when you perturb it, you kind of rock it around. Um, but then you've got another cup over here, and what you want to do is, is have a regime shift where you push it and it comes out of this cup and goes into a different cup, right? If it's resilient, like you have a super deep cup, there's no way you're going to move it. That's a highly resilient system, you can't move it. What you want is something in a flat structure, and then it's easy to move it out of one place to another place. So as an organizational change person, I look for where is the low resilience in the system? Where is it weak? Because if the system is weak, that's a great time for change. So people look at Donald Trump and they're going, oh my god. You know, but it's a great opportunity for change in the United States, if, and they should take advantage of it. If they don't take advantage of it, well, you get the alternative of collapse. You hope it's regime shift because they go to another stable state that's better. They could also collapse, uh, but uh, that's kind of their choice. Um, the other idea that comes out of this is uh, Jerry Rabbits had the idea of normal science and post-normal science. And in normal science, uh, we actually tend to uh, rely on the experts. Uh, but when the stakes are high and the payoffs are big, like nuclear power plants, should we rely on nuclear scientists to actually give us all the advice on nuclear power? And the answer is no, we should actually get involved with uh, citizens. And citizens, like, there's, with enough patience, a, 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 an average educated citizen should be able to figure out what's going on, even with nuclear power plants making decisions. All the plants, all the decisions should not be made by experts. And so it's not clear to me right now with autonomous vehicles that the average person knows why they're doing this. And, and to me, I understand the, the move away from, um, uh, from um, 
internal combustion engines, but I also, you know, I noticed like Mazda, I've been driving Mazdas for a while, and they do the best they can with the existing technologies. And we have all the infrastructure in place for, uh, you know, uh, gas stations and stuff like that. Um, my, my son, um, Adam, works at uh, NIO, with NIO, which is one of the uh, manufacturers, and he has this video, you can see on YouTube, uh, they're doing the electric vehicle, you drive the electric vehicle beside what looks like a garage, you push the button, the car automatically, autonomously backs into the garage, the bottom of the garage comes open, they take the battery out, they put the battery in, in two minutes, and the car drives out. And they're doing this in China, and that's the design, because in China, it's not a democracy. You can actually decide that you're going to have the entire transportation system change. You can say, we're going to stop producing a, 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 a internal combustion engines. And the way you're going to do this, you're going to swap cars, and they're going to drive in in two minutes, they're going to have their battery replaced. I can't see you doing that stuff in the United States, not in a democracy. It's like, there are too many interests, and no, there's no way they're going to do that. So the systems behind it are different. Sorry, this is, this is an interesting topic. And th there's another um, interesting aspect to it, and it, I think it has to do with the generational shift. Because our generation, for us, the, the idea of freedom was a vehicle. But the new generation, the idea of freedom is a cell phone, because that's where their social freedom comes from. So they don't actually have the same interest in driving the way we do. So this idea of, I don't need to drive, a car will drive me around for me, is attractive. So I think what we'll probably see is over the course of generational shift, um, auto driving cars will. Yeah, but, but, but this, is, this is why, um, I don't know, how many people still have a, a, a hard landline telephone line in their house? Oh, that's wow. actually pretty good. That's more than I expected. <laughs> I still have a landline in my house, and the reason is that, um, I don't know if you were living in Toronto when we had the total blackout power failure, the phones still work, right? The phones still work. And that's the reason, is that people forget about the systems that exist, and don't do proper analysis of the systems that exist to find out what it is about that's good about the old system before they're going to the new system. Uh, Bryce Acoff, when he actually, uh, one of the methods he has is called reference projection. And that's really a healthy exercise. You might look at the reference projection for the work you're doing in your MRP because that is an impetus. So what happens if we continue the way that we're going? Uh, the example that he talked about was originally the, uh, when telephone switching was an operator plugging in stuff at a switchboard. If, we, if the people kept adopting telephones at the rate they were adopting them, there would be a requirement for more operators, more telephone operators, switchboard operators, than there were people living in the United States. So it's obviously unsustainable. And so you just go on this trend. Now, in autonomous vehicles, I don't know if they've done that analysis work. It's like, so what if we kept improving internal combustion engines at the rate that we've been turning it? Now, there's going to be get a point where you, you say, you can't do better than that. But that kind of happened in the computer industry, where it's like, oh, we can't make chips any faster. Oh, parallel processing. Now we're doing all these other things. So maybe there was an alternative way of, of lengthening that. and. I don't know, what are the economics of that compared to the economics of autonomy? See, see, one of the things that's interesting for me is it's two innovations happening in tandem, and, yeah. and they're not necessarily the same, right? So one is we should be moving from fossil fuels to electric vehicles, so we should be putting all our energy into making a battery that doesn't weigh a ton. Like, that's, that's why those cars are so heavy, right? So that's one thing, and, and yeah, we could all be driving electric vehicles. The other is the millennium shift to, to people who don't necessarily want to drive and don't care about driving. And I think, you know, sidewalk labs, for instance, their, their argument, uh, we had a presentation this week, and they said, well, we think the people that are going to be living in the waterfront are all millennials. They don't want to drive. That's why we're pushing AVs, because they just want these things. They're going to get them on their phone. They're going to show up, and that's it. And that's why we're eliminating all the private roads. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, but, but, but so this is also a big mistake. And, and, and so one of the things mm -hmm. I wanted to work on is, is the issue of cities and complexity. A city is a complex system, and we know it's not sustainable. Yes. So what are we doing to create, to decomplexify cities? And this is why I find, um, I, I actually say that um, it's interesting to see what happens at the provincial level. I'm really interested in provincial government, because provincial government should actually be trying to get people to move out of Toronto. 
That should be what they're funding, and they should fund it seriously, because having more people come to the city is a increasingly complex, and just gets worse and worse. They're not gonna solve that problem. Like, they're not gonna, you, 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 there's too much of an infrastructure there. We should actually be getting people moving out of the city. So it's interesting, in the mid 80s, the provincial agencies were all rallying uh, architects and urban planners, and there was tons of competitions. We, we, we would, my office at the time, submitted all kinds of things. We won a couple of awards doing alternative village cities, right? And, yep. it, was the, and it was all based on a uh, transportation system that could get you from here to there in like 30 minutes and you could be in another, like Reston or another place, another village that was, you know, two hours from here, right? And the idea was that you wouldn't have suburban sprawl, you would actually have nodes yeah. that were, that there were farms in between, right? And so the provincial funding, so that was their solution, right? They were trying to to aggregate those ideas and get people and developers to build those so that they stop sprawl and they stop the kind of incredible just density or uh, redensifying of the city. They failed though because they never had any implementation plan. Like there was never like they had the land, they had the idea, but they just could not put it all together. And and now the the models are gone. I, yeah. I don't I can't think of the last time anybody was talking about well we should be creating a whole new town somewhere else yeah. that's and well, it's getting Amazon system. coming to Toronto? That's the worst idea. It's like that's <laughs> a terrible idea. <laughs> we don't need Amazon. All it's gonna do is cause more congestion. That's a really bad idea. Drone congestion. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments? Sorry, uh, we're trying to wrap up, but I know that there's probably lots of things that surfaced in David's talk. Okay, well so maybe we'll uh, leave it there. I, I wanna thank David for coming in. I know it was uh, I would say two things. One is uh, you'll probably be digesting this talk for a couple weeks now. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a lot I I can say only because this is also my territory that I, I always learn a lot with David's talk. Is you should go through the material as you're going. I guarantee you, as you go along in your future projects, you will find all kinds of things that you'll want to go back and say, oh my god, we kind of touched on that. I, should, I need to look that up. And get Download the slides and have them because they will come in handy later on, right? As is, he's got lots of resources. And the other thing is once you connect to, to David's site and some of the stuff, he's constantly putting stuff up there that you find interesting. So once again, thank you for coming in. It was great that you could talk to us. <laughs> Tell the, the, the story of how Peter and I got engaged. So what happened was that Peter Jones comes into Toronto. He was in Toronto, and he was working on language action perspective, and he was publishing an article. And so he, he sent a message to my blog. Says, "I notice you're in Toronto quite a lot. Can we meet when I, when you're here?" And I said, "I live in Toronto." <laughs> <laughs>